Okay, great. We're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the webinar today. I wish I could see you all, but the beauty of the webinar is we can join from all over the country and maybe all over the world. I'm not sure who's all on the call, but anyhow, I really appreciate you being here. Today's presentation is called A Safer Family, A Safer World, and it is based on a resource. It's actually a booklet that I wrote, um, and I, I'm going to put the link again into the chat box. So I'm going to do that right now so you have it. But just so you know, it will all of the resources that we mentioned today, including this booklet as well as some other resources, will be sent to all of you after the webinar today. So there's the link to the booklet. So let's see if I can forward the slide here. There we go. So we would love to know a little bit more about who is with us today, and we are going to try this poll here. So if you could, on your screen, you should see a poll that asks, in which field do you work? And you can check all that apply. And if you could click on those and hit submit, and we can see who is joining us today. Okay, excellent. I see a couple more people still entering their response. We'll give it about two or three more seconds, and then I'm going to skip to the results. Wow, great. Okay, so we have quite a few folks from sexual violence or domestic violence programs. We also have quite a few from mental health. Actually, we have someone represented from every category. If you are in the other category, if you want to type into the chat, we can get a better sense of who else is with us today. Okay, great. We are going to move on. So again, my name is Rebecca, and I am the Prevention and Education Coordinator at the Harborview Center for Sexual Assault and Traumatic Stress which is a community sexual assault program in Seattle, Washington. And we actually have four offices in King County, Seattle, Bellevue, Redmond, and Shoreline. A little bit more about what we do at our center. We provide therapy for children, teens, and adults, folks of all ages. We also do urgent or scheduled medical exams. We do advocacy. We also uh, support people doing, during crisis. Our phones are open 24 hours a day. I do community education and prevention in the community. Most of my work currently is school-based, and we also do consultation so we can consult with folks um, who maybe are working with a child, not really sure kind of how to handle a certain situation that they might come across, and they can call and consult with us. And there is our phone number as well as our website. So again, today I'm going to be reviewing a resource that we have created specifically for parents and caregivers of children birth to 12. And so this is this is really geared at parents and families who have children who are younger, um, 0 to 12. And I would say that this resource is really based on the idea that a lot of um, families kind of already have some of the basic facts about sexual abuse. And we also relied on some basic assumptions when we were creating this resource. And so I'm going to review those now. So the basic facts about child sexual abuse is that uh, child sexual abuse involves contact with a child when they did not or cannot consent. It involves the use of a child for one's own sexual gratification. It is more often perpetrated by someone that the child knows. And there are lots of different types of child sexual abuse, both touching and non-touching crimes. Some of the assumptions that we really rely on when we're educating parents about this topic is that adults and older children who touch young children, um, when they touch young children, that is wrong and it is against the law. Uh, child sexual abuse can happen in any community and by anyone. It is truly a profound violation of a child. It is an abuse of power 
And in general, children have the right. It is their basic right to be safe from abuse, and um, they do need some level of autonomy for healthy development. And I really like to acknowledge that, that child sexual abuse is a very sensitive topic in many communities. And some of the information in this booklet that I'm going to present today may not resound with every family. Some families might come from a home country or family tradition where there might be a higher level of gender inequity. Or likewise, you might work with families where children must always respect their elders and never say no to an adult. Some families might see it as more acceptable for children and adults to be in a sexual relationship or a marriage. And so talking about child sexual abuse may need to take a different approach if families have a worldview such as these that differs greatly from these assumptions that I'm showing here on the slide or from the research on child sexual abuse prevention. So you know the families who you work with the best, and it's really important to obviously cater the message where families can really hear it and kind of meet them where they're at. And so some of the information I'm going to present today, I just really like to acknowledge um, in order to be culturally competent that this really does challenge some families' core values. And so engaging families in a discussion, starting from where they're at, I mean, that might even be just talking about the issue in general and just raising awareness about it uh, might be the a first step that needs to come before this educating people about just really the basic facts. Also, you know, awareness campaigns or grassroots organizing can help address some of the more underlying issues uh, that's specific um, to their community. So in using this resource that I'm going to present today, I want people to really feel free to adapt or tailor the message to best meet the needs of the community or the families who you work with. So, some more basic facts. I'm going to start with some statistics here. And you really hear a lot of different statistics out there when people talk about child sexual abuse, and the research really varies on statistics. You, you hear things everywhere from one in three girls and one in six boys. Um, the statistic that I use is this research study that was published recently from David Finkelhor. This is a 2013 study. And what he found was that this was this was through a, a national a national study. And what he found was that you get most the most accurate statistics when you ask teens themselves, specifically older teens, about childhood experiences that they've had. And so what he found in his study was about 26.6% uh, of girls and 5.1% of boys have experienced sexual assault um, sometime in their lifetime. So, so this is asking 17-year-olds about all the experiences they've had from 0 to 17. And so just so we're clear on what we're talking about, the reason why these statistics vary so much is because a lot of the studies, it really depends on how you define sexual assault. And so in this particular study, the questions that they asked uh, the youth were, at any time in your life, has a grown-up that you know touched your private parts when they should not have or made you touch their private parts? Or did a grown-up you know force you to have sex? They asked the same question about a grown-up that they did not know doing the same behaviors. The next question asked about other children, like from school, a boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, at any time in their life, did another child or teen make you do sexual things? And then lastly, did anyone try to force you to have sex, that is intercourse, sexual intercourse of any kind, even if it did not happen? So this is how he defined sexual abuse in this particular study, and you can see these rates are very high. So more than one in four girls and about one in 20 boys. Okay, so here is just an image of the resource that we're talking about today called A Safer Family, A Safer World. And I personally think it looks a lot better printed. So this is how it is printed. Um, and it's kind of collated. So there's different tabs in different colors. And the parents can kind of flip to the topic that they're most interested in. It's kind of stapled in the upper left corner. So this is literally just a picture I took with my camera <laughs> of the actual resource. But it is also available for free download in PDF format on our website. And again, I put the link in the chat box, and maybe I'll just do that again here 
one more time so you have it. And you'll get this afterwards as well. So again, this is really intended for parents and caregivers, and so I'm sure we have a lot of parents and caregivers joining us today, but a lot of you probably work with parents and caregivers and families in general. But I also think this information can be useful to a lot of other types of providers who work with children, not just parents and caregivers. The idea behind this booklet was giving parents and families tools for how to talk to their children and how to approach prevention within their family. I tried to make it really accessible, so it is written at a sixth grade reading level, and it is offered in print and online, and it's also been translated into 10 languages. So if you go to our website, that link that I put in the chat box, you will see the English version, as well as Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Amharic, Arabic, Oromo, Tagalog, Tigrinian, and we are just about to upload the Somali translation. So those will be available. In the booklet, we really tried to give examples of what to do and what to say instead of a lot of don't do this, don't do this, this is bad, this is terrible if you say this, right? So a lot of ideas of just things that they can do and things that they can say to help prevent child sexual abuse. Again, the flipbook format that you're kind of looking at here, obviously it looks different on your screen when you're just looking at the PDF, but when it's printed, it's kind of this flipbook format. And that allows the parents to just access the specific topic and information that they want right now. So maybe they don't want to have any information on um, challenging society's messages, but they want to know more about how do I watch for signs of abusers, they can just kind of flip to the topic that's most pertinent and interesting to them that they need at that point. We really tried to use, or sorry, we tried to avoid language that was really charged or intimidating. So we try not to use the term sex offender or perpetrator or predator or, you know, things that might... Um, you know, just get evoke a lot more emotion. We tried to make the language very accessible when at all possible and kind of less intimidating to families. Another thing that we tried to do, which is kind of a hard shift to make in this field, uh, but this is this is the shift that our field is making in general, is really moving more toward preventing perpetration rather than preventing victimization. Now with young children, that's really hard to do, right? Our worst fear is that children are going to be victimized, and so we want to talk about how to keep children safe from victimization. But I think it's also really important to have that conversation on what are we really trying to do for the future generation. We're trying to prevent people from actually perpetrating these crimes. And really, when you really think about it, is it really possible to prevent a child from being a victim? No. But I think perpetration is really where uh, prevention work needs to be done. And so you can kind of see in the booklet that there is some attempt to also address that as well. So it's a little bit more than I think what you commonly see with child sexual abuse uh, prevention curricula. Uh, we also try to really reduce the shame and the negative impacts that child sexual abuse has when it does occur. So really trying to be super, really, you know, really sensitive to survivors and their families and take the shame and the fear out of it as much as possible. And then lastly, really trying to address multiple levels of the social ecology, so not just the individual and relationship level, but also what are some of the strategies directed at, you know, schools, providers, um, social norms, community level uh, prevention as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to take you through the booklet, and we're just going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the different sections that you see here. Hey, Rebecca, this is Kat. Yes. Before you do that, could you also just explain to people um, what access to this looks like? You know, can folks just download it from your website, print it, and distribute it as they want if they don't mind about it not being, uh, you know, in the same, like, nicely designed flipbook? You know, what are the ways people can use this across the country? Yes. So thanks for asking that, Kat. So it is available for free download, and it's in a PDF format. 
on our website. So it is you are free to use it um, and print it and you know, you know, use it to whatever way you feel is best uh, for your community. So we want it to be as accessible as possible, and we want people to, to use it. Um, we also, with that said, I, I do understand that it does look a lot better, and I think it's easier to read if it's printed. And also printing in full color is also, you know, challenging and expensive. So we are really, really fortunate, and I was going to talk about this later, but I'll just mention this now. We're really fortunate right now to have a, a grant from Seattle Children's Hospital to make this as accessible as possible. And so they've given us some funding to offer free printed booklets uh, to local programs in Washington State. And so I think I'll talk about that later, about how you can actually order that. And obviously, it's only a certain amount of money, so we can kind of offer that first come, first serve basis. But Kat, you had also said that there's a possibility for the coalition to also possibly be distributing this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do plan to make it available to all of our member programs as well. And so folks who are kind of outside of that, um, it basically you can feel free to email me and we can talk about, you know, ways that you can use it and, the, and even, even just little instructions on how to print it so it looks decent. <laughs> um, but as of now, uh, it's already on our website for free download in, uh, I think, nine out of the ten languages that we're offering. Um, if you want us to print it for you, we also offer that service, but there is a fee for that if you are outside of Washington or if you want more than the, than the free number that we're able to offer local programs. So also feel free to just email me and we can talk about that. So um, the other thing I guess I will mention for the, any of you who are in Seattle, and I, I'll talk about this a little bit more if there's time at the end, is Seattle Public Schools is – doing a very large comprehensive effort um, to address Title IX and specifically sexual assault and sexual harassment. And they actually do plan on sending this home with all of their families. And so if you happen to work with kids in Seattle Public Schools, there is a plan at the district level to distribute this to all families. And that's actually why it's translated into those particular languages, because those are the top ten languages um, in our school district. So any other questions, Kat, before I move on? No, I um I don't think so. Okay. Oh, I did have one question. Sure. Um, someone was wondering if you have a version where they can include their own contact information on it. That's a great question, and it's funny because we were just talking about this. <laughs> so we do have plans. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long this is going to take us, but we're hoping that we can work with our graphic designer to make a different version that maybe has some empty space for folks if they did want to put also their local program information. So, again, if you're using this kind of outside of our geographical area and you want them to – you want to refer families to come to your program, we're, we've, we've just begun discussions to try to figure out some design for there to be a blank space so people can do that. Uh, we only ask that people give us credit for the – I guess, the publication or the writing of the document, as well as our funder, Seattle Children's, which you'll see on the very last page in the pink. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. And the first section we're going to talk about today is how to talk to kids about healthy sexuality. And this is considered a best practice strategy in sexual violence prevention. Um, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, NSVRC, has a lot of great resources on their website related to healthy sexuality and how to talk to kids and actually folks of all ages about healthy sexuality and really what the link is with, between that and sexual assault prevention. So again, every resource that I mentioned, like this one, we'll be sending to you after the webinar so you have kind of a, a list of all these links that I'm referring to. <clears throat> So when it comes to healthy sexuality, it can be very helpful to teach children the proper names of their body parts, including their genitals. Um, sometimes families will use special names or nicknames for kids' genitals, and then it kind of sends this message that there's something kind of taboo or different about those parts of the body. But if you just teach these words like you do every other body part, you kind of let them know that it's okay to use those terms and that they could tell you 
or tell their parents if they ever had a problem with that part of their body. Also teaching kids that certain parts of the body are private. So the private parts of the body are usually the same parts covered by the swimsuit. And if you're obviously a parent or caregiver, we suggest using the actual names of the body parts. So next, children have a lot of questions about, you know, at this age, particularly uh, preschool age is when you usually start getting those questions <laughs> about where the babies come from and how they develop. Uh, toileting, body parts, how to keep clean. They really do need these questions answered, and it's a really good idea to think ahead of time about how you might want to answer the question in a way that's straightforward and age appropriate because these questions usually come up at a time when you're not expecting it, like when you're running late to <laughs> drop the child off to school or, you know, some other inopportune time, and so it's kind of good to think ahead of time about how to answer those questions. I get this question a lot, and this is how do we know that kids are actually ready to talk about these things? So parents ask us a lot, you know, when is it okay to explain where babies come from? I think a good general rule of thumb is if the child is asking, that's a really good sign that they are ready. <laughs> so sometimes you might give them a little basic information and just wait and see if they have more questions. So it's okay to just give them a little bit of information that you think is right for their developmental level, and then just wait and see if that satisfies the question. If it doesn't, they will keep asking you for more detail, right? But how did the baby actually get in there, right? So th then that's important to you know answer them correctly and honestly. Another question that we get a lot from parents and families is, you know, the child is exhibiting some kind of sexual behavior or sexual play, and is this normal, and should I be concerned, and does this mean that the child's been sexually abused? So one of our take-home messages is that occasional sexual behavior and play is common <laughs> for young children, like acting out family roles, playing doctor, playing house kids are exploring and touching their own body, that's a normal way to learn about their body. At the same time, parents and caregivers can set limits and teach children touching rules, and we'll discuss that more in the next section. And if you're not really sure about whether a child's sexual behavior is normal or concerning, you can call our center or your local sexual abuse program. Most sexual assault programs across the country are very used to getting these types of questions. As a general rule of thumb, I teach a whole training on this, so I won't go into it too much, but as a general rule of thumb, when the behavior is occasional, it is spontaneous, it is usually between equals, it doesn't interfere with other interests and games that the child likes to play, um, it's mutual, it's kind of lighthearted, that's, that's what we consider kind of typical for that developmental, that a younger age group. Uh, when we'd be a lot more concerned is if that sexual behavior or play is happening a lot, so more than just occasionally, it's starting to kind of interfere with other things that the child usually does. Uh, maybe it's coercive. Maybe it's a child who's purposely kind of targeting another child who's younger, more vulnerable. And most importantly, if it continues extensively even after the adult has instructed them to stop, then we would be a lot more concerned. So in general, a lot of sexual behavior in play is normal, it's common, it's to be expected, but at the same time, we can teach kids behaviors that are okay, not okay, and teach them boundaries around that. Lastly, there's lots of great books out there, and I really recommend getting these books. I have a whole book, book list on our website if you're interested, and I'll show you some of them today on the next slide. But um, just I think that's a, another way to kind of take the anxiety out of it is just check out some books, and those can give parents a lot of guidance on how to talk to kids about these topics in an age-appropriate kind of way. And my other advice is to just put those books on the bookshelf with all the rest of the books, right? Don't just sit them down for that one awkward conversation and say, this is really important, you need to listen, and then you keep it in a special secret place, you know, that book. Just put the book with all the rest of the books. And again, that's kind of taking the, the taboo and the embarrassment out of the topic. So here are some of the books that I really like. There is a book called Your Body Belongs to You by Cornelia Spellman. 
It's My Body, uh, which is for really young kids. You can read this as young as, you know, maybe with a two-year-old. <clears throat> and that's written by Lori Freeman. Second Step, um, which is produced by Committee for Children, they have an actual curriculum that you can use in the schools. And this is called the Child Protection Unit in Second Step. And again, we'll send you all this information after the fact. But in general, what this is, is it's actually a school-based curriculum that can be used for lots of different grade levels. And so I believe they have this for um, pre-K through fifth grade. And what I also love about it is there's not just a child component, but there's a staff training component for schools, and there's also a parent training component. And they even have several YouTube videos that are free online for parents to view. And so that is something that any parent can access even if their child is not getting this curriculum at their school. I also, when it comes to healthy sexuality and talking to kids about sexual health, I love this book series as well. These are books by Roby Harris and illustrated by Michael Emberley, and there's a series of them. It's Not the Stork is geared at kids ages four and up. It's So Amazing is a book geared at kids seven and up, and then It's Perfectly Normal is for ages 10 and up. And so, again, this is a really nice way to help parents explain some of these concepts that kids often have questions about, but parents aren't always sure exactly how to answer it. And it's in a very age-appropriate way, and that's kind of why you see this series here for the different age levels. I also love the illustrations. There's a lot of body diversity, which I also think is really important. And so I love the illustrations that are, to me, just as important as the words. <laughs> Okay, lastly in the booklet, we really want parents to have some ideas of things that they can actually say with their children. So these are some quotes, things that could actually come up with, with their own children. So <clears throat> everybody's body is different and special. That kind of gives children the underlying message that they are unique and special, that their body deserves to be treated with respect, and, but also that there's a lot of variation in bodies, and that is okay. Your body belongs to you. It is important to take care of your body and help keep it healthy and clean. I used, Many years ago, I used to teach preschool, and we did a curriculum called Talking About Touching, which was also from Committee for Children. And one of the questions in that curriculum is, who does your body belong to? And almost all of them would say, my mom, right? My body belongs to my mom or my dad or my parents. And... So teaching kids that they own their body and that their body belongs to them is actually an important concept for them to learn. And with that comes a lot of responsibility, like keeping it clean and letting someone know if they have a problem with their body. So here's another example of using, you know, the actual term. So the baby grows in the woman's uterus. A lot of times you'll hear kids say, like, how did the baby get in their tummy, right? And so... That's where you get all those questions about, well, did they, did she swallow it? Because they think that the tummy, you know, the, 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 the fetus is actually in the stomach when really it is in the uterus. So giving kids that kind of correct terminology is a way to kind of normalize all of the parts. It's okay to look at and touch your own body. You can do that in your bedroom or in the bathroom. So again, kids are nat very naturally curious about their bodies, they, they do learn by looking and by touching. And over time, they learn about their body and their body parts. Uh, this fascination eventually does wear off, right? <laughs> um, and so families do agree that if this is okay in their family, that their child can touch their own body, it's also okay to give them some boundaries around that, like where it's okay to do or when it's okay to do. And so here's when you get that awkward question and you're not really sure what to say. One thing that parents can say is, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I'm really glad you asked me. I'm going to get us a book so we can learn about that together. So you're modeling that it's okay to not always know the answer, but validating them that you're glad that they asked. So there, you kind of avoid that embarrassment or the shame. Like instead of saying, like, where did you learn that from? Or who told you that? Or I'm going to wait and let so-and-so teach you about this. Um, really validating them and saying that you're glad that you asked them is really important. 
then it's totally okay to do some research and get back to them. It really takes the pressure off of parents and caregivers when they don't have to know the answers all the time and they can be more prepared. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to you and ask that you type up your thoughts in the chat box. So I'm going to give you a scenario, and I'm just curious how you would handle this if this came up for you in your work. And I will read the scenario, and then you can feel free to type your responses, and uh, we'll be able to read those and uh, mention a few of them. So a parent tells you that her five-year-old son is starting to have a lot of questions about bodies and where babies come from. He also touches his penis occasionally while playing or when it, while in bed. She tells you that she does not know what to do in these situations. Okay, so what would you do in this situation? What would you say to the parent? And go ahead and type your response into the chat box. Okay, great. I love what folks are saying here, reassuring them that this is normal. It's normal behavior for this age. This is all very normal behavior. So reassuring the parent these are normal occurrences for the age of the child. It's okay to tell the child where and when that is okay to do. That's normal. Kids at this age are curious about many things, including their own bodies. What a nice way to say it. He is at an age where it's really normal to have questions about his body and where babies come from. Um, someone else said, validate her feelings about not knowing what to do. It's okay to not know, and I'm glad that you reached out to me and asked me. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Tabitha said, body curiosity is normal. Talk to him about when and where this is appropriate and ask him if he has any questions. I love it. Great, thank you everyone. Kat, I'm gonna pause and see if there were other questions that you had flagged for me. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah, there were a couple, Rebecca, uh, that I think will probably be pretty uh, easy to answer. So someone was asking, where on your website do you find the list of children's books? Oh, okay. We'll send that out after the webinar, but on our website, we have a resources link, and it's it's under the list of resources. Okay, great. And then we have another question. Have you had a chance to read the book, Sex is a Funny Word? If so, would you recommend it? I have not had the chance to read that book. Well, if anyone else on the call has, and, um, you know, you do have any recommendations or considerations about it, feel free to type those into the chat and I can send them back out to everybody. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, we'll move on to the next topic here, the next section of the booklet, is how do I teach consent, boundaries, and touching? So some of the concepts I think that are important to teach families about is um, to look for everyday opportunities to model consent. It can be helpful for children to have the chance to decide how they want to share their body or if they want to at all. And so some ways to do that just in everyday interactions with children is how do you want to say goodbye to me today? Or your friend is leaving now or grandma's leaving now. How do you want to say goodbye to me, to her? Um, can I have a kiss or a hug? You know, so if you're dropping your child off to school, asking them um, what they prefer and how they want to say goodbye. Um, I, I love asking kids if you have permission to share something personal. So I really appreciate what you just shared with me. Is it okay for me to share that with so-and-so? Like, is it okay for me to share that with your teacher or with your dad? Um, and so, again, oh, another example that I hear people say all the time is if someone's crying, why don't you go and give them a hug, right? So instead of saying that, what can we do to make him feel better? Can we ask him what he needs to help feel better? And so instead of forcing the hug or forcing the apology, asking kids their ideas of what the other child might need to feel better and then asking the child what they need to feel better. 
Okay, another great concept that's really important is teaching kids how to understand language that means no and how to recognize others' feelings. So it's not just teaching kids themselves how to say no to other people, but also understanding what does it look like when somebody says no to you and how can you recognize that and how can you respect that. I have found that animals <laughs> uh, can be a really good way to teach nonverbal communication because Sometimes someone telling you no is verbal, but sometimes it's nonverbal. So the cat is walking away from you. I think that means that she doesn't want to be touched right now, all right? So if the child does have any interaction with animals, I have found that they have been a really good way to teach consent. So when their ears are back or when their tail's between their legs or when they're walking away or looking away, those are signs that they don't want to, they don't want you to touch them right now. So while, like, maybe during a game, look at his face. Does it look like he's still enjoying the game? Does it look like he wants to stop? You know, helping kids recognize the facial expressions of other kids and whether or not it looks like they still want to be engaging in this behavior. So wrestling is a really good example. So taking a, a timeout for one second and asking, hey, does it look like both people are still having fun? That's really important. Another idea is, you know, I see her shaking her head. You know, so the child, let's say that, let's say the child's trying to touch another child and she's shaking her head and the child's not recognizing that nonverbal cue. So really pointing that out. She's shaking her head. That means you need to stop, right? So just reinforcing and putting words on the behavior that they're seeing. Okay, next, including body safety rules in your other family safety rules. So a lot of families are already talking to kids about safety. You're talking about helmets. You're talking about seat belts. You're talking about, you know, fire safety. Over here in Seattle, we talk a lot about earthquake safety. We do fire drills. We do earthquake drills. Um, what to do if they ever see a gun. You know, all of these types of safety messages. Just include those body safety messages with every other safety message that we teach children. So. It is not okay to touch other people's penis, vulva, breast, bottom, because those are the private parts of their body. It is not okay to show other people your private parts because those are your private areas. And other people should be following these rules too. So it really puts the onus on the person who is doing the touching, not the person who's being touched. So teaching the child it's not okay to touch other people on their private parts and other people should re be respecting that with you as well. Another safety rule that I really like is if you ever have that uh-oh feeling or, you know, that feeling that someone's making you feel uncomfortable, it's okay to make up a reason that you need to leave. And obviously this would be an example for kind of an older child who can understand that. But giving them a more graceful way to leave a situation. A lot of safety curriculum tell kids to scream no and to run. And I've always wondered, you know, would a child actually – would a lot of children be willing to do that or able to do that if this was a beloved, you know, relative? So giving them kind of more nuanced ways to negotiate those situations and leave if someone is making them uncomfortable. Okay, here is another example of a book that I love, and this is actually free online, and there's the link. This is a book called Some Parts Are Not For Sharing by Julie Federico, and we have this printed and, and used this here at our center, but I also actually found it free online. So I'll just share with you some of the pages from the book. So everyone has a body. Even fish have bodies. Some parts of our bodies we share with others, for example, our hands when we high-five someone or shake their hand. We share all of the parts of our bodies except the private areas. The private areas are any area covered by the swimsuit. They are called private areas because some parts of our bodies are not for sharing. And so I, I won't read the whole book, but that kind of gives you an example with these cute illustrations of another way to kind of explain these concepts of body safety with, with young children. Okay. Also in these conversations, we really want to be leaving the conversation open for kids to report. So what I recommend is encouraging them to report without putting a lot of pressure on them that they have to tell and have to run and scream and tell the parent immediately. 
I think just more encouraging them that they can always come and talk to you is a better message. And the reason why, and actually I saw someone ask this in the chat, is what if you're doing this kind of messaging, prevention, education with a child who's already been sexually abused in the past, and now they're getting worried because they didn't tell anyone about it, and a lot of times there's, as we know, very good reasons why kids don't tell, and so now they might feel bad, and it might feel even harder to come forward now because it did happen a long time ago, and they haven't told anyone. So... I would also try to avoid that really charged language, like if anyone ever touches you, I would kill them or I would hurt them. Um, all that kind of stuff really makes it harder for kids to come forward. So some of the things that I think are better to say are things like if anyone ever touches your private parts or touches you in a way that hurts you or feels bad, you can always come talk to me or another trusted adult, and you will not be in trouble with me is also important to say. Another thing parents can say is, it's my job to keep you safe, so you can always come and talk to me if anyone ever makes you feel hurt or sad or confused or uncomfortable, even if it's someone that I like or someone that you like, right? So it's kind of opening the door to come and talk and tell if someone hurts them, even if it's someone that is in the family or someone that the family knows and likes a lot. Okay, lastly, teach others what or tell others what you are teaching your child. Share this information with other parents, your child's teachers, daycare providers, babysitters, grandparents, relatives. Tell everyone. And, you know, one way to do that would be, you know, we're talking with our child about consent. We've been trying to model by example. So we ask before we touch them, and we hope that you can do the same. And, you know, another thing that parents can say, you know, to a teacher or to a grandparent is we're talking about body safety and we've told them to come and talk to us if anything makes them uncomfortable. And so telling others is a way to really spread the word about prevention. It's opening up that conversation to the larger community, not just to your own family, but to others who your family interacts with. And this really reinforces the messages and we really hope that teachers and grandparents and everyone else who has kind of a caregiving role or even interacts with our children is also reinforcing some of these messages. But I think it also puts others on notice, <laughs> those who actually might have poor boundaries or maybe even worse, you know, people who might have bad intentions, um, that this family is aware of these issues. Or, you know, in this, you know, in, in another case, a school, you know, our school, our classroom, the kids are aware of this, of this issue. And I think that sends a clear message and puts people on notice hopefully, um, if maybe they don't have the best of intentions. Okay, so I'm going to turn it all to you again in the chat box. So I'm going to give you a scenario, and if you could discuss your thoughts of how you would handle this or what you would say or do in the chat box, that would be great. So while visiting with the family, you notice that one of the children, Jayla, frequently touches her siblings and tries to hug and kiss them. When the other children are touched, they pull away from Jayla. The caregiver tells you that she does this all the time and they don't like it. So if you could type into the chat box some of your ideas of maybe things that you could do or say to help the caregiver in this situation. Okay, great. Daniel said, let's establish some boundaries for the children so everyone feels comfortable with what's going on. That's great. Um, Anne, thank you. Tell the caregiver to ask Jayla if it looks like the other kids are getting hugged and kissed. Laura said, ask the caregiver if she has tried to talk with Jayla or corrects the behavior as it happens. Give her suggestions if she's open to hearing them. Um, Leah said, would do interventions with Jayla, the other kids, and the caregiver. With Jayla, you could talk about appropriate touching. With other children, talk about expressing their boundaries, saying no, and uh, what parts of the bodies are private, what parts we share, et cetera. Wow, there's so many great comments here. I can't keep up with all of them. This is great. 
Um, Carol said, I love that you want to show your siblings how much you love them, but let's think of some other ways to express that. So high fives, fist bumps, that sort of thing. Brianna said, ask the mother what she would like Jayla to be doing instead to see if she can frame what she wants in a positive way. That's great. Okay, thanks, everyone. Okay, so many great comments. Thank you. We are going to move on to the next section. Kat, any questions I should be addressing right now before I move on? Yeah, so we do have just a couple. Um, and I think you kind of already touched on this, but someone was wondering if you would be talking about um, more in depth about teens who have been sexually abused as young children um, since they've already been exposed to that. But I know, you know your resources were really created for younger children than teens. Yes. Yes, this particular resource booklet, as well as the, the training today, is really focused um, only on parents and caregivers who have the younger children, so kind of the, the infants through the kind of the school age children up to about fifth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And then at that point, I think the message really does kind of change uh, developmentally when you're talking about teens, and, and there's obviously some specific needs about teens who have already experienced child sexual abuse. Um, in, in earlier in childhood. So I'm free to, ha I'm open to having that conversation outside. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to consult with you. Oh, thanks for that offer. Um, we do have two more questions for you. Okay. Um, so someone shared that, um, you know, in some recent uh, child sexual abuse prevention work that they've been doing, that um, a Latina parent shared that they kind of had some concerns around the, um, in telling kids to say no to hugs with adults. Because in her culture, a child has to have an adult or it would be rude. Do you have any advice on how to approach this? So that's a great question. And this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, is kind of using some of this messaging um, just simply as a toolkit. So if for some families, some of this information is not going to work. Um, I do understand that in, in many cultures and in many families, the, the hug or the kiss is kind of the obligatory, you know, how you greet or how you say goodbye to someone. Um, what, and I, I personally do understand this because it is really hard when you're saying goodbye to grandma who you don't see that often and your child all of a sudden doesn't want to say anything. <laughs> and it, it, it's kind of embarrassing as a parent um, when you're, you know, you don't want your child to be rude to people. And so one thing that I, I like to say is, you know, we do need to say goodbye, but it's kind of your choice how you want to say goodbye. So what is the best way for you? Because we're not going to see grandma again for a really long time, and she's going to really miss you, and I know you're going to really miss her. So what do you think is a special way that we could say goodbye, but still giving it as an option to the child, but at the same time really encouraging them to do something that is still a respectful way to greet someone rather than just, you know, running away and not saying anything. Um, but again, families, I think, are very creative. And I think coming from this standpoint of reinforcing why these underlying concepts about consent are so important for the safety of children, I think most parents can really get behind what we're talking about here truly is safety. And so some situations, yes, we're not going to be able to always give kids options and consent. But in situations where you feel like you can, it's really important to allow them to get those experiences to negotiate those social situations because there are situations that they could be in where an adult could cross the boundary with them. And we want them to understand that they have the right to not be touched in a way that they don't want to be touched and that they can tell someone about it. So I think kind of explaining the background to families, too, can also be a way to approach it. Thanks, Rebecca. We had someone yeah. else um, chime in on the chat while you were talking, really just reinforcing that they're doing the same exact thing you are describing, you know, really coming up with other ways that the children, that a child can kind of show that gratitude or say goodbye or say hello, and then also just doing a lot of conversation, um, you know, about why this is happening with the other members of your family or in your community. Um, but it's a really, it's a great point just to talk about that all of the strategies we talk about in prevention are always going to have to be a little bit tweaked, a little bit customized. Yes. 
there, there are a few things that are going to be, um, you know, always the same. Um, and it's great that people are willing to ask that question in your community to say, like, not just to ignore the advice you give them, to say, like, hey, I'm so invested that I want to talk to you about why I think this doesn't work. Let's talk about how we can make it work. And that's just also a really great um, sign that the work you're doing in your community is really catching people's attention, too, to have those kind of absolutely. questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank There's you. one last question for you, Rebecca. Um, do you have a resource that you use um, or that you would want to direct people to for, you know, what happens when a parent or a caregiver or a provider calls CPS, like what they can expect um, around mandated reporting? Ooh, I'm going to have to give that some thought. I don't have a resource right offhand, and that's certainly something that here at our center we work with families around, like if families were to call um, and ask questions about how to navigate the system, um, working with Child Protective Services, or they find out that someone called on their family. You know, another really hard thing to navigate is when families are calling a center to get help, but then they realize that if they're calling about a child, you know, the, the, the center that they're calling is often a mandated reporter and going to have to report. So we do try to have really open conversations with families about that and talk to them about navigating the system and kind of the process that CPS or Child Protective Services goes through. But I need to do a little bit more thinking on that. So if you give me, give me some time after the webinar, I can think if there's anything out there or if other folks feel free to type in the chat. Thanks for that, Rebecca. And, you know, if we run out of time today, too, we can send any follow-up resources to folks later on. I mean, okay. I think as a place to start, I would say, you know, if anyone has this question who doesn't work at a local sexual program, the first step would probably be to give them a call, talk to whoever is doing kind of their youth advocacy work, and get them to help, you know, uh, talk through that process. Um, we also did have someone share that. Uh, the DSHS website does have a video on mandated reporting, um, and the coalition does have some resources too. So between Rebecca and myself, we'll come up with a couple things to send out to folks as a follow-up. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so this actually is a nice segue into our next. The the question about cultural competency um, is kind of a nice segue into the next um, section here. This is this is one of the ones that probably most likely will, um, you know, be challenging to some some communities' values. And at the same time, a lot of the concepts in this section are very much tied to the research when it comes to sexual assault prevention. And so we're going to talk about that. And this is kind of a harder conversation to have, I think, but um, ways that we can translate this um, into, you know, talking with young children. So there is a lot of research out there about sexual assault and specifically about sexual abuse perpetration. And again, if we're trying to prevent, ultimately prevent perpetration, so there will be no more victims, um, what we need to do is, is look at, well, what are the conditions that make it more like, make, make someone more likely to offend sexually? And so the CDC has put out some great research on this topic, and there are a lot of risk factors at the individual level for someone developing uh, offender or perpetration kind of behaviors. So that would ex include someone who's exposed to sexually explicit media, more likely to develop perpetration behaviors. So we need to be talking to families about that. Um, someone who adheres very strongly to traditional gender roles someone who generally accepts violence is more likely to develop perpetration behaviors. We can also look at kind of larger societal issues and community level issues, such as social norms that support male superiority and sexual entitlement and women's inferiority and sexual submissiveness, as well as societal norms that support sexual violence. This is shown in the research from the CDC to actually increase the risk of child, or sorry, of um, sexual assault. So we need to be somehow translating this information into um, ways that we can talk to kids about this. I also thought it was really important to include something on adultism <laughs> because adultism is another form of oppression that really is a root cause specifically of child abuse. So in other words, in our society, you know, adults have this extreme power over children. I mean, if you think about it, for those of you who are parents, you know, you think about 
Like, sometimes you've got to control every little aspect of their life, like when they're even allowed to eat and when they go to the bathroom. And, you know, everything is very controlled for young children. And sometimes this power is necessary to control them, to keep them alive, (laughs) to keep them safe, to keep them healthy. But sometimes this power can be taken advantage of. And child abuse becomes a way to kind of exert that power and control, just like other forms of interpersonal violence, like domestic violence and sexual violence. And so we're going to talk about how to translate this into a a kid-friendly kind of way. So children hear a lot of things outside of the home that influence the way they think people should act. Some of the things they hear are unhealthy and can teach children to treat others badly. You can talk to kids about what they are seeing on TV or hearing from friends. You can challenge ideas about gender roles and children's lack of power. It is important that children don't hear adult and teen sexual comments. Children should also not watch TV or movies with adult sexual content. It's important to treat boys and girls equally with the same rules and expectations. Some harmful messages about boys are that they should always be powerful, in charge, and they can't show their emotions. Harmful messages about girls is that they are weak, too emotional, and that their looks or their appearance are what's most important. Sexual abuse may be more likely to happen in communities that believe strongly in messages like these. So again, trying to translate that CDC research into a way that's accessible for for parents. So this shows kind of some examples of how parents can intentionally counter those harmful gender norms about boys. So boys can be sad. Boys can be sensitive to others' feelings. Boys can talk things out. They can take care of others, be polite, be a good friend, and they can play with whatever toys they want to. Girls. Girls can play rough. Girls can be angry. They can be strong. They can rescue people. They can be leaders. They can make the rules. And girls can also play with whatever toys they want to. And just to make it really clear, uh, what we're really talking about is all kids. So all kids can do all of these things. This is kind of that explicit statement to clarify that these characteristics we talked about or feelings or behaviors or norms can really apply to all genders, all children. Okay. Now we'll move on to that concept of challenging adultism. So parents have the right to create rules and expectations for their children. It is also important for children to know that sometimes they can say no and that their voice will be heard. This may protect them from abuse. An abuser might take advantage of a child who doesn't know how to say no to adults. You can show your child you respect their opinions even when you enforce the rules. Allow your children to sometimes disagree with you, to practice saying no, and to make choices for themselves. It's important for children to be able to speak up if someone is being unsafe. So here are some ideas of things that families can say to their children. I think a very powerful way to address that extreme power difference and the control that adults have over children is simply apologize. (laughs) Apologies, I think, are very powerful. So I made a mistake and I'm sorry. I didn't realize that embarrassed you. Thank you for telling me how you were feeling. I respect what you are saying and I will stop because you asked me to. Now again, you can't always do this, but finding opportunities where you can really respect their no and stop. So if you're leaving the house and they say, no, I don't want to go with you, right? They might not have a choice on that. They have to come with you. You can't leave them there alone. But find other opportunities in the day where maybe they say no and you could model for them that you will respect the no and you will stop. Okay. Here's here's back to that safety messaging too talking about safety rules. What can you do if someone touches you in a way you don't like? What about if someone asks you to do something that is against our rules? So leaving this conversation kind of open uh, is, a, is a good safety tool. And then what I say by, what I mean by open is 
you see how this is worded, where it leaves it open where it could be anyone, anyone doing this kind of touching or breaking the rules. And you could even be more explicit with the child and say, even if it's an adult who's breaking the rules, even if it's someone who we respect who's breaking the rules, even if it's someone who's in a position of power. But I think leaving it kind of open like this is a way that gets at the actual risk to children, which is usually people they know, but also in a way that's not really scary. You know, like we don't want to scare them that every single person out there could hurt them. <laughs> that's not a good message either. And so leaving it really open-ended and kind of moving away from those traditional safety messages, which is more like don't get in the car with someone you don't know, don't take candy from someone you don't know, you know, that's more of a stranger danger, which isn't really the the huge risk to children. It's more people that they know. So leaving it open asking them to problem solve and what they would do, but really trying to, without scaring the child at the same time. Okay, so that's the end of this section. I'm going to give you another scenario, and you can type into the chat box what you would do. So the children you work with are role-playing a superhero game. And for those of you who are parents, you can also imagine your own children, but I'm, in, I'm envisioning someone where you actually have a supervisory role with, with children. You hear a child say, you can't be the superhero. He's a tough fighter. You can be the girl. So what would you do or what would you say in that situation based on this topic of challenging some of the harmful societal messages about gender? Rona said, anyone can be a superhero. Let's see. Thank you so much. Oh, these are all great. Jennifer said, you can be whatever you want. Christina said, make sure he knows girls are also superheroes. Maybe show the pictures of superheroes that are girls. Alicia said, anyone can be a superhero. We are all superheroes. And Carol said, of course, girls can be superheroes and they can be tough too. <laughs> girls can be tough fighters. Anyone can be a superhero. That's, these are awesome. Thank you. I would continue the, Kristen said, I would continue to role play with the child and state that I can be a tough fighter and a girl. And that way we will both be superheroes. So I love what you all are saying. These are great comments. In this scenario, at any time you see these, these messages, perpetuated, I think it is important to speak up and disagree, and you can even talk, you know, with an older child about how that's a, that can be a hurtful comment or a stereotype that's directed at girls, and that's not okay. Um, also, like in a classroom setting or any kind of setting with children that you might work, where you might work with them, you can say, no, it's not okay to say girls can't do something, or there's no such thing as boys' toys and girls' toys or boys' games and girls' games. We can all play the games that we want. Excellent. These are great comments. Thanks, everyone. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next section of our resource. And so this is, we're going to talk next about how do I watch for signs of abusers. And so this is kind of shifting the conversation a little bit. Earlier in the first few sections, we're talking about how to talk to kids about these concepts, but that's just one part of prevention. Arming kids with safety education is just one form of prevention. Prevention also needs to be adults and supervision. So adults watching out for adu other adults and other children, actually, who can abuse other children. And so adults play that role in supervising, but also intervening. And this is really based on the research on grooming that's also done by David Finkelhor. We'd, I don't use the term grooming in this booklet, but that's what we're talking about. And Finkelhor has this research on the preconditions that offenders look for, these preconditions before they offend against a child. And so it's based on that research. And it's also very much based on the bystander approach, which is another promising practice and best practice in our field, uh, teaching bystanders how to intervene, how to speak up, how to help in a situation that's concerning. Okay, so let's look at this. <clears throat> 
talking to kids about these topics is just one part of prevention. Another important part of prevention is watching out for concerning behaviors from adults and teens. It's important to sh always know who your child is with, where they are, and who else will be there. Avoid having older children watch younger children for long periods of time with little supervision. Abuse usually happens by someone the child knows and usually happens in secrecy. Be aware that children can be abused by other children and by adults, including people living in your home or even people working at schools and youth programs. If someone's behavior makes you uncomfortable, trust your instincts and don't let your child spend time alone with that person. Abusers often seem very nice so that they can develop a close trusting relationship with a child. And so again, this is trying to give parents some of the basic facts about child sexual abuse, um, also including some of the research, like one of the biggest risk factors for child abuse, again, produced by the CDC, is a non-biological transient caregiver living in the home. So for example, the mother's male partner, the mother's boyfriend, um, a step parent, um, so anyone who is non, not related to the child but living in the home um, is at an increased risk for perpetration. And so including that, again, in a non-scary way in the booklet is important for parents to be aware of. <clears throat> and so now I'm going to move on to some of the examples of concerning behaviors in adults. I want to really acknowledge, as I said earlier, that kids can also abuse other kids, and that's important for parents to know. But the truth is when it comes to grooming, that's much more the dynamic that you see with adults abusing kids. You don't so much see typical grooming behaviors with child offenders. So with youth who offend, it's, it often tends to be more spontaneous, uh, less planned out than it is with adults and sometimes they're taking advantage of a situation when supervision is really low. Um, so it's important to educate parents about the different dynamics and the different types of abuse. But this information here is really more focused on the dynamic that usually exists between adult offenders and child victims. Okay, so here are some examples of concerning behaviors in adults. So adults who give children special attention, like affection and compliments, um, to one particular child or group, uh, giving them special treatment, so like gifts, privileges, letting them break the rules, um, being very child-focused, so always wanting to touch with, touch them, play with them, relate to them better, um, and this is key, while also trying to kind of in exclude <laughs> the parents and caregivers. So the, the adult who's very child-focused, but also at the expense of kind of excluding other adults, that's that is concerning. Uh, someone who has poor boundaries, so not stopping when someone says no or when the child looks uncomfortable. Talking about inappropriate things with the child, like sexual topics or about their personal relationships. Um, and then lastly, asking child, the child to keep secrets, looking for places and opportunities to be alone with the child. Those would be concerning when you see adults doing that with children. So we want to also give you some tools and give parents tools for how to talk to someone or confront someone when they do have some of those concerning behaviors or poor boundaries. So it looks like he's not really enjoying that game anymore. Or I feel uncomfortable when you talk to the kids about blank, like your girlfriend or your boyfriend or uh, when you make comments about what they're wearing and that sort of thing. Excuse me. Please have the door open when you're playing. Even though you're here, I still need to see him. And then lastly, it really bothers me when you talk about their bodies and call it flirting. So these are just some examples of how to approach someone who maybe is not exhibiting the best boundaries or who has some of those concerning behaviors. Again, you're kind of putting that person on notice and telling them kind of how you feel about the situation and making it clear that you see what they're doing. <clears throat> So when you speak up and say something, it's also a really great model for the child. So a lot of times the child may not feel comfortable speaking up, but doing this on their behalf can also be a nice modeling to give them the skills to do that in the future. Most people, when you do kind of confront them about their poor boundaries, will be really understanding, and most people will just stop. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that made you feel uncomfortable. I feel really bad. That will never happen again, and it won't. 
But on the other hand, an abuser might get super defensive or they might say, you're being really sensitive. Um, they might make you feel like you're kind of the one who's being inappropriate. They might continue the behavior despite your concerns, or maybe they stop for a little while and then they go back to being more secretive again. So if this ever happens, it's really important to watch the person if they're around the children, uh, talk to friends and family members about it. So, you know, opening up that conversation to other people and then also calling our center for advice or, or your local sexual abuse program. Hey, Rebecca. Oh, yes. So we've got a couple of questions, if this is an okay moment for that before we go to another scenario looks like you have. Yes, I'll try to do it quickly because we've got one more section. Okay. Um, so can you repeat, what was the name of the researcher who discussed the preconditions? David Finkelhor. Okay. And we'll send out um, some, we'll include that on our list of resources for you folks. Yes. Um, I actually have a list of all the research that I'm citing today. I have a list of that. If folks want it, we can send it out. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. We've had a couple of questions about the research, so we can include that for sure. Yes, I have a whole list already. And then we've got a question, is it better to not call it a game? Is it better to not call it a game? I'm sorry, yes. I, don't, I don't quite understand. In what context? Looks like... Kelly, do you want to share more about what your question was? you want to type it into the chat feature? Um, and then it, while we're waiting for that, Rebecca, we have another question uh, that says, do you need specific examples where these adult-child boundaries are different, like, for example, teens or with different cultural backgrounds? I'm sorry. Did you say – oh, okay, I see it here. Do you have specific examples where these adult-child boundaries are different? Um you know, that's that's a great question. I don't have any specific examples offhand. I need to, again, kind of think about that and do my research. This, the, I'll just go back to that slide. This is based on, again, the research that's specifically around grooming. And so I don't, I, I think this is probably, I, I'm assuming, um, based on kind of like mainstream dominant culture. And I don't know if this has been actually studied um, with specific cultural groups. That's such a great question. So I need to kind of do some research on that. And again, like what I was saying with teens, um, we don't so much see, when teens are abusing younger children, we don't so much see this kind of long drawn out uh, grooming process. Adult offenders tend to be uh, very, very socially skilled and manipulative um, and are very patient. So they co kind of go through this long, sometimes go through this long process of developing trust and a close relationship with the child and even the parents uh, before they actually sexually abuse the child. And so with teens, it tends to be a lot different. It tends to be kind of less planned out, more spontaneous. Um, sometimes, you know, whereas adults, you see them very socially skilled. Sometimes the teen doesn't have a lot of social skills. And so um, sometimes it's a matter of kind of maybe they are developmentally delayed or maybe they, you know, are taking advantage of a, of a situation where there's really poor supervision. So with teens, it tends to be a little bit of a different dynamic. <clears throat> Thanks, Rebecca. That's helpful. Sure. Um, and then okay. the, um, the question about the games was about, like, tickling and those kind of things. Um, is it better not to call it a game as far as tickling? I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with calling anything a game, um, but certainly – I, I'm assuming Kelly's asking this because an offender might also frame some of their touching as a game, and that is a tactic that some offenders might use with a young child. But I think if you're uh, a, a, an adult interacting with children, I don't think there's anything wrong with calling whatever you're doing a game, just as long as you're really kind of also enforcing those concepts of consent, like making sure that the child's wanting this to happen and that this is okay with them and that they always have the right to stop or say no or change their mind, that sort of thing. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, sure. So I'm going to give you a scenario and ask what you all would do in this situation. So two parents come to you and report that one of the volunteers at your program makes them uncomfortable. They report that he asks the kids if they have boyfriends. The volunteer frequently takes pictures of the children with his phone. <clears throat> so if folks could type into the chat and 
let us know your thoughts on how you might handle this situation. These are great. Okay, let's see. Okay, I would validate the concern and assure them that I would immediately follow up with my supervisor. I would thank them for coming forward and letting me know what their concerns are. I would discuss the issue with my supervisor and create a plan of action. Thank you, Malini. Okay, Ellen said, ask the parents if they have addressed this with the volunteer themselves yet. Either way, I would speak with the volunteer about appropriateness, boundaries, and not taking photos of the children due to privacy and confidentiality, if applicable. I would ask that the volunteer delete the pictures um, with me watching, so as a witness, and review program boundaries and results of not abiding by these. Thank you, Ellen. I think a lot of folks have a really great idea of things that they could do to both uh, validate and thank the parents for coming forward with their concerns and also uh, talking to the volunteer directly. Some folks are saying, you know, not making assumptions about where what this what's happening, but trying to get the information and trying to respond and enforce good boundaries. I think this also speaks to a larger issue if you are in a supervisory or administrative or leadership role at your organization or school, that there are policies ahead of time that deal with this. So it's so much easier to talk about, you know, you're not allowed to take pictures of the children um, if you actually have a policy on that. So instead of waiting for the poor boundary to pop up and then creating a policy around it or waiting for a bad thing to happen and then creating policies around adult-child interactions, it's so much better to have these already prepared and ready to talk to volunteers and staff about it. Even having volunteers and staff sign off on your policies is really good. And again, yay CDC, they have a great resource on this. There's a whole booklet that they have called Preventing Child Sexual Abuse within Youth Serving Organizations, and they have all kinds of great recommendations to develop policies at your organization or your school um, to best protect children. And we will, again, send that after the webinar with the list of resources. Okay. With our last minutes here, I would like to move on to the last section, which is how do I respond if a child has been sexually abused? When you're reading this, I know most of you on the call today are providers, but just keep in mind the intended audience of this is parents and caregivers. So, for example, you all mostly are probably going to be mandated reporters whereas parents and caregivers are not necessarily mandated reporters. And so we want to, from their perspective, talk to them about how they can best respond. So really your response starts now. So showing your children that you are there for them anytime they have a question or concern, no matter how small, listen to them, hear them. When they do come to you with a concern or a problem, tell them first that they are glad that they told you. They may feel more comfortable going to you with a big problem if they felt you heard them in the past with a small problem. And despite our best efforts to protect children, sexual abuse can still happen. Your response and support is very important. There is actually research that shows that the reaction a child gets from the first person they tell is actually a factor in their recovery. So if that first person believes them and supports them and listens to them, that's going to be a lot better outcome for them usually than someone who doesn't believe them or tells them to keep it quiet um, or convinces them that they're wrong. The best take home message from this whole, this whole resource really should be that children can and do recover from sexual abuse. We get so many calls from parents worried about what's going to happen to my child long term after this has happened. Are they going to be dealing with this for the rest of their lives? Are they going to be struggling? Are they going to be quote unquote damaged? The answer should always be they can recover and they do recover. There's really good help out there for your child and that parents also need that help too, parents and caregivers. And that's why at our center and a lot of sexual assault programs, we do serve also the non-offending caregivers as well. They need support. <clears throat> so 
how do we respond if a child's been sexually abused? So if you, re if you suspect that your child's been sexually abused but you're not sure, supervise them closely. Watch for changes in their moods. Leave for the conversation open. You can always talk to me if something is bothering you. Call our center or your local sexual abuse program to get advice. If your child tells you that they've been sexually abused, it is normal to feel upset or in disbelief. It's important to stay calm and believe the child. You can tell them that you're glad that they told you. When abuse has been reported by a child, do not allow supervised contact with the abuser. You can call local police or Child Protective Services to make a report. You can seek a medical exam to make sure the child's body is okay and to collect evidence. And you can call our center for support. And lastly, if you're worried about a child acting out sexually or touching others inappropriately, seek professional help. Talk to the child about the body safety rules and what kinds of touch that's okay and not okay. Teach and enforce the rules as you would with any other rules about safety and respect. <clears throat> Again, call our center or your local program to get some advice. Okay. <clears throat> so this last scenario, I want you to think about what you would do in this situation. And one, you could think about if you were the family member of Carlos. And two, you could think about if you're the provider working with Carlos because I do understand that your response might be different um, depending on your role with this child. So Carlos tells you that his coach was touching him and he did not like it. Carlos says that she told him if he told anyone, he could not play basketball anymore. So if you would type into the chat box how you would respond, what you would do, what you would say. Next steps you would take, and I'll read as many as I can. <laughs> Anne said, tell Carlos that you believe him, you're sorry this happened to him, and you're glad that he told you because it's your job to keep him safe. Christina said, oh, hi, Christina. <laughs> um, as a family member, I'm glad you told me you are not alone. I will do everything I can to make sure that you are safe. I'm going to call someone who can help us. Okay, Jennifer said, assure him that he did the right thing, telling you and ask if it's okay to get further help, um, such as talking to a counselor or getting medical help. Okay, Amina, thank you for this comment. Um, Nina said, thank you. Thank him for telling you and validate his feelings. Explore what exactly the coach did. Tell him he can play for another team if he wants. Okay, so I, I want to talk about that briefly, um, exploring exactly what the coach did. It's really important um, if you do ever get a disclosure. Now, look at the actual scenario here. We didn't, we don't know exactly what happened, right? We don't, we don't, necessarily even have uh, a disclosure of sexual touch, right? Just as she was touching him. However, this is very concerning because of, you know, her also telling him that he can't play basketball if he tells anyone. So this is very suspicious, but we don't actually know what happened. And so in any role, it's really important if you are going to try to get more information to only ask open-ended questions. The best way to do that is to say, you know, thank you for telling me. Can you tell me more about what happened? Okay? That's a very open-ended question where you're not leading the child to say a certain thing, and that's really important. Um, I have seen cases where the school nurse or someone who really has good intentions asks the child a bunch of leading questions, like, did she touch you on your penis? Um, that's a very leading question, and if the child says yes, um, then it's always going to be a question um, in, you know, if this ever goes to court, you know, did, did they put that idea in Carlos's head? So you want to make sure that the questions, if you are going to seek more information, are very open-ended. Um, but I love what everybody's saying here about thank you for telling me, trying to get more information, trying to be really supportive to Carlos, reassuring him that it's your job to keep him safe and you're going to do everything you can to try to help him. So I think all of those are really good. Now, here's the difference. When you're the provider, you are a mandated reporter. So you a lot of times will have to you know put this in someone else's hands to look into it further 
if you're a parent or the or his aunt or his uncle or the concerned grandparent, you know, you you are not necessarily a mandated reporter, um, but you still have that option to make that call and to seek help for him uh, from your local sexual assault program um, and or um, authorities. <clears throat> So with our last couple minutes, I'm going to go to the last slide here, and I wanted to give folks some additional resources. So here, uh, the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is hosting the, the webinar today. They have a whole section on their website that we'll send you after about child sexual abuse prevention, which is really great. There's a lot of good resources on there. Also, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has a great booklet for parents specifically um, after a child's already disclosed or actually um, been sexually abused already. They have a great resource on how to support children and how to look for programs um, such as ours that use evidence-based treatments and research-based interventions for helping survivors of sexual abuse. Our website, hicksats.org, also has some great resources like this booklet itself, but also um, the book list that I was talking about we also have a new teen handout, so you can look for that. And that is, um, again, hicksaps.org, and then click on the resources. And I really would like to acknowledge, again, uh, we really appreciate funding from Seattle Children's that gave us some seed money when this whole thing started, and uh, we really appreciate their funding that allowed us to kind of create this and make it look beautiful <laughs> with graphic design, but also make it accessible to lots of other um, programs by being able to offer some free copies. So again, we'll send you that information how to order them. And then lastly, I think I mentioned earlier about the plan to distribute this within Seattle Public Schools. And I really appreciate the partnership with them and they have um, helped uh, hugely with the translation process. So now this has been translated into 10 languages total, and those will all be available, and most of them are already, um, on our website. Again, hicksats.org. We will follow up after the webinar with um, all the resources and the research and, that we mentioned today. And I wanna also invite folks to reach out to me, as well if they have specific questions for me, anything I talked about. Kat, do you have anything else you want to say? You know, I don't think so. This has been really wonderful. We did have a couple of questions that came in right at the end, um, but I want to respect everyone's time. So um, I will sh make sure that Rebecca sees your questions, um, and then either we'll try to follow up with you directly, or we may be able to just include some of the answers to that out to everybody if we think that would be helpful as well. So we want to acknowledge that to the folks who submitted some last-minute questions. Um, you'll see here on your screen, there are just a couple of things we asked for you to do at the end of the webinar um, to send us the names of folks on the call who um, didn't sign in themselves, if they're with you, take our quick survey. Um, and like Rebecca said, we'll be sending you an email shortly. It will have the slides, a bunch of different extra resources and links that are helpful to you. And then sometime later this week or beginning of next week, we'll post all of that on our website so that you can get access to it um, later or share it with other people. But in the last second, I just really, really, really want to thank Rebecca. This was such a wonderful webinar. She is just uh, a great resource in our state. I'm so happy that she was able to do this. And the booklet is amazing, and I can't wait to be able to show it to our program. I'm seeing some other comments coming in from participants saying how much they really appreciate the webinar. So thank you again, Rebecca. This is great. And thanks, everyone, for calling in today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yes, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.